Hi, this is Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. Thanks for joining me for this week's episode of the Sonic Scoop podcast. And today is going to be an important episode because I'm going to give you what I think is the biggest mindset shift you need to make when it comes to mixing in order to get mixes that are captivating, that are impressive, that are alluring, that stand up to the sound of your favorite records. This is really one thing, but in a way, it's more than one thing because it is a mindset shift where once you change your mind about what the most important thing in mixing is, everything else starts to fall into place. And this is something that's come up again and again, particularly when I do coaching calls with mastering clients or mixed coaching clients who are starting to get really competent at mixing. But the better they get, the more they notice that their mixes, their records, their productions don't sound as impressive as engaging, as captivating, as immersive as like their favorite commercial releases that they're comparing their mixes to. And almost invariably, when that is the case, it's because they have not made this one biggest mindset shift yet. Now, I'll tell you what I mean about competent mixing before we get into this really big mindset shift. And when I'm telling you that there are competent mixers who haven't gotten this yet, these are people who are making it so that everything fits together pretty well. You can hear the bass pretty well. You can hear the kick pretty well. You can hear the snare pretty well. The vocals are there. There's nothing that's off. There's nothing that's like leaping out as, ah, that's wrong. You're doing something bad in the mix. Like everything is competent, but they themselves can hear there's a gap between where they are and their favorite releases. And it's not just songwriting or performance. There's something in the production that's not all the way there. And it's almost always this one thing. Now, I'll kind of give it away a little bit here in the beginning for those of you who don't want to get through the whole podcast episode. It's a podcast episode, so we'll go fairly deep, fairly long, and I think I'm going to give you some concrete examples to make this really stick and give you specific things to listen for in your own mixes. But I'm going to give up that one thing right now. Here is what it's all about. The mistake that competent, good mixers make who are not yet up to amazing mixers, is that they care too much about making everything be heard equally well at all times. They care too much about getting a well-balanced mix where everything fits together. And you're going to say to me, wait a second, I thought that was like the whole point of mixing. You're supposed to adjust levels and stuff until you can hear everything clearly and all the elements in the mix, now they're on kind of equal footing and they can be heard. No. That is not what makes great mixes sound great. The most important thing in mixing is finding the most important thing in your mixing for that one track. The most important thing in mixing isn't making everything be heard equally well and fitting together all of the puzzle pieces. The most important thing in mixing is to find the point of the song to find the focal points of the song, to find the most important thing or things in the song and make everything else serve those most important elements. Making a truly great mix where people walk away remembering, oh man, that sounded cool. I loved that vocal sound. That sounded cool. Did you hear the kick drum or the drum sound on that song? Or that song was so cool. I love the effects they put on it. Having that kind of emotional reaction from people where they love not just the song, but the production of the song requires that you prioritize things and find the most important things in the mix. Now, what are those most important things likely to be? What are you likely putting too much focus and attention on right now that you shouldn't be? How do you discover what the most important thing is in this particular song and what should be like second most important, third most important, fourth most important? And how do you take this concept, this idea, and put it into action and actual practice? Well, those are the details I'm going to give you in this podcast episode. So let's get into it. The only thing I have to do before we get into it is give the briefest of shout outs to our sponsors, the most important sponsor, as always, being you. 
If you want to sponsor this podcast, the best thing you can do is just sponsor yourself. Check out one of our full-length courses like Mixing Breakthroughs. It'll give you a full system for mixing. We'll go through a ton of different mixes together in a variety of genres and styles, and you'll get a framework, a roadmap for mixing that's going to work every single time. Check it out, mixingbreakthroughs.com with a full money-back guarantee. Also, one of the most useful things I've probably ever done is the full-length course Compression Breakthroughs. If you want to learn to hear compression and use it like a pro with a super short learning curve compared to what you're going to get otherwise, check that out over at compressionbreakthroughs.com. Or if you want to get into mastering, you can check out the full-length course Mastering Demystified over at masteringdemystified.com. Super quick shout out to this week's brand sponsors. We have got Focusrite. I'm speaking into a lovely Claret interface right now. Hasn't given me a lick of trouble. They make some of the best values out there in interfaces. And if you get a Focusrite Claret interface, you're going to end up getting the Hitmaker expansion bundle totally for free, no extra cost. That includes things like auto-tune, some great mastering and mixing tools from Brainworks, an awesome reverb from Relab, great drum samples and guitar amps. Definitely check them out over at focusrite.com, where you can check out their entire line from the entry-level Scarlett series all the way up to the high-end Rednet series. Big thanks also to Sound Toys, making some of my favorite creative mixing effects in the known universe. Try out anything they make for free for 30 days over at soundtoys.com. And speaking of free, if you want something totally for free, I got a free plugin deal for you right now for a limited time. Go over to gpu.audio slash sonic scoop. That's gpu.audio slash sonic scoop to get a free convolution reverb powered by the GPU inside your computer. With all that out of the way, let's get right into it. The most important thing in mixing, the most important mindset shift to make is that mixing is not about making everything be equally heard well at all times. It is about finding the most important things in your mix, the focal points in your mix, highlighting them, protecting them, featuring them for the listener, and getting other things to play a supporting role in making that decisive. And how do we go about doing that? First, identifying which should be the primary focal points and which should be more supporting elements, and how do we differentiate those two? All right, let's dive deep right now. And I was inspired to do this because I did a whole bunch of coaching calls the week that I'm filming this one. And they were with some really competent, good developing mixers who've been at it for a long time, but just wanted to break through to that next level. And it was like just three of these calls back to back and all of them had the same issue when we were listening together to their favorite records versus where they had wound up with their mixes. And each and every time, it was this same thing. We'd listen to their favorite records and I'd say, oh man, this sounds cool. I agree. This sounds awesome. But why does it sound awesome? You love the bass sound in this one, but why do you love the bass sound in it? You love the vocal sound in this one. Why do you love the vocal sound in it? And it is because in each of these mixes that they held up as references, the mixer had picked the point of the song the focal point of the song was one, possibly two elements that are the lead elements, and then everything else was kind of beneath them. First example happened to be a guy who's working on a lot of hip hop stuff. I'll also give you some examples in rock and pop and electronic and other genres. But real quick, let's start with hip hop because I probably don't talk about hip hop enough on the podcast, even though I master plenty of hip hop. And this guy, all of his favorite records, first of all, were significantly drier than his mixes were, and that's something worth noticing. Often when people are mixing and they get their tracks mastered, especially the effects come out even more, they don't really notice while they're mixing that they're loading in denser effects than might occur in some of their favorite records. I find it's rare that it goes the other way around, people using a lot less in the way of things like reverb and delay than they're on their favorite records. Often they're using more. But that wasn't the the biggest issue. It was that things were a little bit of a soup. And they were a little bit of a soup because he did a fine job of making sure that you could kind of hear everything if you wanted and switch your attention to any particular element at any particular time. But that's not what his favorite records sounded like. His favorite records, most of them sounded like this. The lead instrument is the kick drum and the vocal. Those are the two lead instruments and practically all of the mixes that he loved the sound of. And then maybe after that, there was like second tier supporting elements. In most of them, it might have been snare. It might have been a key sample or it might have been a bass. 
So there might have been these two lead instruments almost always in this genre, kick and vocals and particular types of hip hop production he was into, followed by maybe it was snare and a specific sample or snare and maybe bass, but relatively uncommon. There'll be a bass line in the particular uh, reference mixes he had. And then everything else was like tertiary, the third thing, the supporting elements. And that distinction was clear. And how did that happen? How did the mixer do that? Well, there's a few things. But probably the biggest things there are, one, level, two, panning, and three, depth of field. And depth of field has to do a little bit less with reverb and delay, which might be what comes to mind, and a little bit more about EQ. You can make things be in the foreground or be in the background, basically depending on how bright each of those sounds are. Sounds with more mid-range, upper mid-range, and particularly top end tend to come forward and kind of leap forward. Sounds with more transients tend to come forward and leap forward. And sounds that are darker, have less top end, potentially less upper mid-range, and potentially smoother or softened transients tend to sneak backwards in the mix. So on some of these records, you'd find like kick and vocal, surprisingly just like dry and up front and straight down the center. And then there would be some elements, maybe a snare, maybe a specific sample that would be just slightly less dominant than them. That would be your secondary kind of supporting elements. And then the everything else. And the everything else, you'd be surprised in almost all these mixes, they were treated the same way. They were set further back in the speakers and they were a little bit darker than the other elements and a little bit less dry than those primary focal point elements. They would also often be the elements that were panned slightly to the left or slightly to the right, kind of getting out of the way of the center stage that was occupied by those most important focal point elements that had so much room in the center because there was only a few elements trying to be in the center. And those other supporting elements were tucked out of the center. Not necessarily panning hard left and right to be ear candy, but panning away from the center so that the elements in the center could have the center for themselves and stay being the focus. And this is a slight mindset shift here because often with these incidental extra supporting elements that we might pan out and might be further back, we think of them as being ear candy. And sure, that's a fine way of thinking about them, and they kind of serve that role. There are ear candy elements that aren't the main focal point, but for those of us who are paying attention, we end up hearing them if we're listening deep into the track. But to just think about them as ear candy, I almost never hear anyone talk about what's the meat and potatoes of this track? What's the main course of this track? What's dinner? In this case, in this track, it's kick and vocal. That is our meat and potatoes, and then like our side vegetable or starch is, do you like these analogies? The side vegetable or starch is snare drum, right? So thinking about it this way, putting the focus in your mind into what's the most important thing in this mix, what should be the central focal points, how do I make them more important, it's a better way to think about it like that rather than think about, oh, these ear candy elements, what should I do about them? Nah, man, candy is for after dinner. Fine, think about candy. But so many people think about candy before they've had the dinner, and then they end up not having the impressive physique of their dreams. And you, you're not going to have the impressive mixes of your dreams if you're thinking about the candy all the time, instead of focusing on how important it is to actually get through a damn healthy dinner. And think about that in your mixes. Man, I just made this analogy up on the spot. I didn't plan that one. So let me know if it's any good in the comments down below. Tell me if this is working for you. If it's not, we'll try some other analogies as we go along. All right, so that's just one example, hip hop in particular. But another artist I was working with, more of a pop mix, and then we'll get into more of a rock mix. But uh, another one, more of a pop mix, and it was different elements, but the same exact idea. Now, there was one particular track where it was the same things were the main focal elements. It happened to be kick drum and vocal because it was a pop track that had an EDM style of production. 
and like kick drum and vocal straight down the center, primary foreground elements. And then after that, supporting elements was maybe snare and I forget if in this one it was a bass line or a guitar was like the secondary supporting element and then everything else. And the job of everything else is primarily to stay out of the way of the most important things and secondarily to add interest. But this is a big part of the mindset shift. Starting to think about these other elements while you're mixing, their primary role not being adding to the mix, but the primary role being staying away from the most important things in that section or that moment or that song. And once you start thinking like this, you'll start to get the kinds of really impressive sounds that you hear on a lot of your favorite records. Now, this could be totally different. There was another pop track where it was like the kick drum was not the most important thing. The two most important things in this track were vocal and snare drum. And then the secondary supporting instruments were bass, and it might have been bass and some guitar-like instrument. I forget. But there are a lot of pop tracks where it could be vocal and snare are our primary things, and now below them is bass and maybe some other element, and then everything else is in that tertiary, third place, supporting role group, where their job is not to get in the way and use whatever space is left in there. Now, it doesn't have to be the obvious things like kick drum or snare drum that are a focal point, like we've talked about in a few examples. There are tracks where, like, if you listen to Pharrell Williams' Happy, we talked about this in great songs with quote-unquote bad mixes, one of the focal points of the rhythm section of that song is the hi-hat. And it's a very unusual focal point to have in a song, but it's so important in that song. The hi-hat pattern, it's more important than the bass line. And the hi-hat in that track kind of dwarfs the bass line and is more articulate than the bass line, but it totally works because the mixer, in this case, Leslie Brathwaite, I believe is his name, he made the decision of, no, 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 this is what's important to the groove. We're juicing that up. And although the bass line is cool, it's going to be a supporting element behind the vocal, and the hi-hat on this particular mix for this particular groove. In a different song, it could be something totally different. You could have a song where the primary elements are vocal and piano, or vocal and acoustic guitar. I think in one song we listened to with one of my clients, it was vocal, and I believe it's called bazooki, a Greek instrument that's almost like halfway between a mandolin and a sitar and a guitar. Kind of cool. But the interesting thing we came up with, this was a particular client who had a lot of different genres and artists he was pulling from, but one of the common threads that separated his mixes from those mixes is in those mixes, you could almost always immediately tell what the focal point was, what that mixer thought was most important, and it would be something appropriate to the style, genre, production they were going for. Now, sometimes you can choose for yourself a bad reference that doesn't make sense for you. Or sometimes you can choose a good reference for your, you and for your production, but kind of ignore the lessons you're getting from it. If you use a song as a general reference and kind of sonic benchmark that's mixed like an EDM track, but you end up mixing your song like a rock track using rock style focal points, you're going to end up in a very, very different place. And every time you compare your mix to you know, that target mix, they're going to sound way off because you chose different focal points. So once you start listening in this way, you might sometimes encounter things in some of your references. If you're using them as general mix references where you're like, whoa, I didn't approach my mix at all with the same kinds of focal points as this mixer did on this mix. And you could do one of two things from there. You could say, okay, not an ideal reference. Maybe I don't want to match so many things about it. Or you might end up saying to yourself, whoa, I'm mixing this totally wrong. I have a whole bunch of preconceived notions about how loud the vocal should be, how loud the snare should be, how loud the kick drum should be, how loud the bass drum should be, how loud the guitar should be. I have all these preconceived notions about it, but I'm going so far away from where I actually want to end up because I'm not actually listening to these records and hearing first how they have handled these elements, how they have prioritized them. 
And I'm not making my decisions with that set of priorities in mind. And this can be a big problem sometimes when you're referencing something from a totally different genre. Like there are rock mixers who will mix a track, but they're using some EDM tracks as references, and they mix their rock track like an EDM track. And then later they go and compare their rock track to a whole bunch of other rock tracks, and they're like, why don't my guitars sound impressive like on all these rock tracks? It's like, well, you weren't paying to the same attention to the same things that all these rock mixers were paying attention to. If you want to have a rock track that's mixed like an EDM track, you can do that. And if you want to have a hip hop track that's mixed like a pop track, you can do that. But just know that when you compare your mix to other mixes in that actual genre, something is likely to sound a little off or a little different. And that is okay to do if you're doing it consciously. If you sat down, thought about all the different things you could feature, and you said, hmm, These are the things I'm featuring. It might be unorthodox for this style, but I'm going to do it. If that's what you're doing, awesome. Have at it. But if you're just kind of mixing mindlessly and going by preconceived ideas of how loud things are kind of supposed to be and just trying to make everything fit together and be equally loud, and you're never thinking about, man, what should be the most important focal elements in this song, then you're probably going to end up with a mix that's not super inspiring. Because here's the big secret behind all of this. When you walk away feeling like a few things were particularly impressive in a mix that you just listened to, a couple of things really stood out to you in a production, whether it was the drum sound or the vocal sound or the vocal effects, or whether it was the guitar sounds, whatever it might be, Those things sounded so super impressive because other elements in the mix were allowed to sound unimpressive and to sound and feel like supporting elements. That idea of contrast is so huge and so important. What makes a vocal sound so upfront and like it's really in center stage is that there aren't a lot of other things also trying to be center stage. What makes a drum kit sound really big is that maybe it's dwarfing your electric guitars. And what makes electric guitars sound really, really big is that maybe it's dwarfing your drum kit. Or maybe it's dwarfing your bass. And what makes a bass line sound really important and really interesting and like, oh man, I can't help but think about the bass line in that song, is maybe there's a whole bunch of other elements that you'd normally expect to be loud in a mix that are kind of taking a back seat and letting the bass line be up front. A great place to think about this is in kick and bass, because I can and will give you all these different tips for how you make kick and bass sit together and trying to make them, you know, not fight in the same frequency range. And I might give you the advice of try to pick one and make one the lowest. So either your kick is lower than your bass or your bass is lower than your kick and make your EQ choices accordingly. And I can give you that advice about how to fit them together like puzzle pieces. And that's useful to know. You can do things like side chaining, right? Side chain the bass and kick together. But in the tracks where there are the most memorable kick sounds, you're like, whoa, that kick drum sounded awesome. If you ask yourself, wait a second, what is the bass doing? Sometimes you'll be like, eh, the bass isn't that important at all. And it's just like staying out of the kick drum's way. The reason the kick drum sounds so big and massive and important in this track is because the bass is taking a little bit of a backseat to the kick. And maybe the kick is a tier one instrument or a tier two instrument, and the bass is a tier three instrument, or any combination thereof. It could be the kick is a tier one instrument, the bass is a tier two instrument, or it could be the kick is a tier two instrument, and the bass is a tier three instrument. And one of them is being allowed to take a back seat to make the other sound more impressive. Totally the reverse when you hear a song with an amazing bass line. It's like the most memorable bass line you've ever heard. It's like a super important part of the production. Ask yourself, what is the kick drum doing? And often the kick drum might just be like a tight little nugget 
where it might be this big, low, woofy thing that's beneath a really delicate and intricate bass line, or it could just be relatively quiet. But often, the most impressive bass lines you're going to hear are because the kick drum was taking a back seat to the bass. And that's what made the bass sound so interesting, so impressive, so forward. These kinds of tricks can also make things like vocals or guitar solos or a key important sample to come up front by having other elements behind them really be behind them, making them set further back in the soundstage, whether that's with EQ, whether that's with volume, maybe keeping out of the center with a little bit of panning. Those kinds of things can make things fade away to stay away from the main focal point elements, and they will make those main focal point elements sound more impressive by contrast. The reverse is true, too. If you want something to really come forward, then having it straight down the center, maybe having it be super dry, and if it has effects on it, maybe having those effects separate from the sound slightly, say with a pre-delay on a vocal reverb, or say using a delay instead of just a big washy reverb on a vocal. Those are the kinds of things that can allow you to both make a vocal and a vocal effect both be tier one or tier two kinds of instruments. So some of the things that bring an element forward in a mix are keeping them centered, keeping them dry, or if you're making them wet, having the wetness kind of be separated from the dry signal. Also, obviously, volume and to a degree brightness and how much transient you allow to remain in the sound can all bring things forward and make them occupy center stage. Another trick that can make things sound super coming at you and impressive is if they're dry and hard panned. So center stage really leaps out at you, but also dry hard pan also really leaps out at you. So you might have a particular track where the two main things down the center are like the vocal is the tier one instrument and the tier two instrument down the center right behind it is snare drum. But the other big tier one or tier two instruments are hard panned electric guitars that are just glued to the front edge of the speaker, super loud, super wide, while still leaving center real estate for something like vocal and snare drum to really speak and still sound like some of the featured elements. And if that's the impression you want to give of really just super engaging vocal and really super impressive wide upfront guitars, then that means that some other elements may need to be further back in the mix. You're maybe in that mix not also trying to make the bass the most important thing and the cymbals the most important things and your wide pan toms the most important things. Because as soon as you start doing that, and now your hard panned hi hat and your hard panned toms are supposed to be just as important as the super wide electric guitars in your rock mix, all of a sudden those super wide electric guitars don't sound so impressive anymore. We don't have the contrast between slightly quieter toms and cymbals, or slightly backseated bass line, or a slightly less impressive kick drum that could make those guitars and that vocal sound even more important and impressive. So I've gone over this topic some length now. We've talked about it in hip hop. We've talked about it in pop. Now we've just talked about one possible way of going about in rock. There's other ways than what I've just described to mix any particular rock track. But it's that idea that you want to be thinking about if you want to be as captivating as some of your favorite mixes. So I want you to think about what are some of your favorite mixes of all time. Sit down and listen to them and think about them in this way. What is the one or two most important tier one focal point elements in that track? Then what are the one or two secondary, second most important elements in that track? And then what's tier three? What's everything else category? And how is the mixer allowing those supporting elements to sit back in the mix? And how are they bringing your attention to those most important elements that you picked? You may find a couple of examples out there of favorite songs that you have that 
weren't mixed in this way, that don't have clear focal points, that don't have a clear vision for what's most important, second most important, and what's just support. But my guess is that those songs are remarkable to you because they're great songs and not necessarily because they're great productions and great mixes. So what we're talking about right here are the productions that jump out at you. So pick those tracks where you've always thought, oh man, that track is one of the coolest, most badass bass lines of all time, and listen to it. And then ask yourself if this principle was applied. Apply the same kind of thinking to the tracks that you think have the coolest drum sounds, the coolest guitar sounds, the coolest kick sample, the coolest vocal sound of all time, and see if this kind of thing is at play in there. So pick some of your favorite tracks and let me know in the comments down below, did you hear this kind of approach in them? And if so, what seemed to jump out to you as the most important, the secondary supporters and the tertiary tier three instruments, where their job was to stay out of the way and to give deep listeners an extra treat. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Sonic Scoop podcast. If it's helped you, definitely remember to hit like and subscribe and let us know in the comments down below. If you adopt this strategy, if it changes things for you, I absolutely want to hear about it. I read every single comment down there, or you can email me over to podcast at sonicscoop.com. If you've listened to me talk for this long, it means that you are totally weird and I like you. And for some reason, you don't mind hearing me talk for extended periods of time, which means if you want to do a full-length course on mixing, mastering, using compression, who better to do it with? You can check out one of my full-length courses like Mixing Breakthroughs that will teach you to mix better, faster, with more creativity and confidence than ever before. We go through a whole bunch of mixes together, a whole bunch of audio examples. But in addition to all that, getting our hands dirty, getting our ears wet, and actually listening to stuff together, we're also going to give you a framework, a roadmap to mixing, a clear order of operations that you can go through that's going to work for you every single time to make your finishing time for each mix go way down while your quality, confidence, and creativity goes way up. Check that out over at mixingbreakthroughs.com. Or if you want to learn everything that I know about mastering, you can check that out over at masteringdemystified.com. It comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee, like all of the courses. And if you just want to wrap your head around hearing and using compression like a pro, finally cutting your learning curve down from potentially years before you really master compression and limiting, which is common, and you want to cut that down to a tiny fraction of a fraction of that length to really start mastering compression, then Compression Breakthroughs is the course for you probably one of the most useful things I've ever done. Check it out with a money-back guarantee at compressionbreakthroughs.com. Last quick shout out to our sponsors. Thanks again to Focusrite for this lovely Claret interface. And with any of these Claret interfaces, you're going to get their Hitmaker expansion bundle, which comes with so many great free tools, channel strips for mixing and for mastering, vocal tuning tools, amp simulators, virtual drum kits, pretty much anything you need to make a record is included in those bundles. So check out everything they make over at focusright.com. Big shout out and thanks to Sound Toys, making some of my favorite creative mixing effects in the known universe. Try out any of these super fun effects they make for free for 30 days over at soundtoys.com. I know you're going to love them. And last but not least, if you want a free convolution reverb, there is still last chance for limited time access here too. A free convolution reverb from GPU Audio. Get it at gpu.audio slash sonic scoop. That's gpu.audio slash sonic scoop for your limited time free early access to a convolution reverb that runs on the GPU in your computer. Thanks for hanging out with me for this week's episode of the Sonic Scoop podcast. This has been Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. See you next time.